Right. Hi, everyone. So this is the live stream from Silympiad for food science. Um, I'm Stephanie. This is Ethan. And then that's Ishika over there. Uh, Hi, everyone. Yeah. So thank you for tuning in tonight at 730 and listening to us sort of talk to you about the ins and outs of what the topics are this year. So I don't know, I just wanted to have a little brief slide to talk about us. Um, uh, all three of us are from Pennsylvania. We're from Shadyside. Um, Ishka and I are in Div C, um, but my brother here is in Div B. And um, Ishka and I did food science for um, the two years when we were in middle school. And back then uh, we did uh, one year on dairy and then one year on grains. Um, and this year it's on uh, fermentation and its topics. And my brother here is um, in that event right now. So he's just here if any of you guys have any questions and um, I don't know any, some just more general information about us. Like uh, we've all been to like uh, regionals, states and then Ishka and I have been to nationals um, and like we've competed in this event um, at like all three competitions. Um, Ishka has a few national medals under her belt and um, we all just like um, have, you know, had some pretty, some pretty crazy experiences here and decided to share a little bit about food science. Um, Ishka, do you have anything to add? Um, I think you covered it. Cool. Okay, so let's get started. So this year's main topic is on fermentation. Um, and I just wanted to have the slide as an overview, um, just uh, to like what I'm gonna explain. I'll talk about some various fermented foods, um, uh, fermented processes, go into detail with some of those, and then just talk a little bit more about some specific processes. Um, so I guess, uh, there are a lot of fermented foods. Ethan, can you name a few? Uh, yeah, there's like natto, miso, kombucha, sourdough bread, kimchi. There's just like the common ones. Yeah, that so. That be like asked. Yeah, definitely. So um, I guess in the event, um, something that's important is first of all, be able to identify a lot of fermented foods. And once you have like a, a very like cohesive list, um, you probably want to uh, have uh, how they're fermented. So whether, um, you know, that's a process or like what is added. So like right here, like you can have um, like maybe the pH it needs to be at or if there are certain um, bacteria that are used. Um, like I know that yogurt has like lactobacillus and I'm sure that, um, you know, a lot of other foods are like that. And also, um, you should probably add the processes they, that they have to go um, through to be fermented. Um, you know, you can have foods like kimchi that are just refrigerated, or you can have um, foods that um, are pickled or foods that, you know, need to be dehydrated and things like that. And then to the right over here, here are just some examples of um, some foods that are fermented. So up here is kimchi, um, down here is sourdough, and then to the right here is kombucha and then these like yellow circles are uh, things called scoby and then this is just some ph paper yeah so there's lots of processes that you need to know in fermentation so right here uh at the top we have heterolactic and homolactic fermentation and um so in fermentation there's lots of bacteria that are used so uh these bacteria usually go through these two types of fermentation and each of them gives off a distinct taste or, uh, yeah. So, um, homolactic, they all use glucose and they convert it to the bacteria. Uh, homolactic, it converts to lactic acid and then heterolactic converts to ethanol or carbon dioxide and uh, lactic acid. And then at the bottom, you need to know the citric acid cycle, which is really important, also known as the Krebs cycle. Um, yeah. So it's the conversion of glucose to energy. You need to know like pyruvates and acetyl-CoA and all of the enzymes that are involved in this process. To like eventually aid in the fermentation yeah. process, right? Yeah. Okay, so next I'm gonna talk about um, something that's um, a little bit out of the box, um, but it's available water value. And basically uh, it just, it sounds like what it is. It's 
the available water value content in food and this value can help determine uh, the growth of microbes, um, you know, such as like bacteria and mold um, through like a scale between zero and one. So just to give you um, just a perspective, like a 0 0.6 average water value is the uh, minimum amount um, required for just like growth of life. Um, and there are many processes that can influence this average water value, um, such as uh, dehydration, freezing, uh, refrigeration, um, pickling. And basically, uh, if, um, I mean, you probably won't have any labs this year, but you might have some maybe like short answer responses or like lab simulation responses um, uh, to like, um, like for this uh, available water value. So I know last year um, during the lab process, like they, like people actually had to use this value in the labs um, to sort of find like the moisture content of a certain food. Um, but this year um, you can basically find the moisture content um, in relation to this, like through these steps, just a very simple process of just like massing something before, uh, massing a food before and then massing it after you've like squeeze all the moisture out and then sort of just dividing the two. Um, so something else you have to learn about is the different types of organic molecules involved in these processes, uh, primarily sugars and enzymes um, in uh, this case. So um, enzymes uh, are used in the citric acid cycle and in other cellular respiration processes as described earlier, for example, acetyl-CoA. Um, and so you might have to know uh, what some of these enzymes are. Um, there are different enzymes that catalyze um, different sugars in the body when you digest them. Um, that's what Steffi and I had to focus more on. Um, but since this year is more fermentation focused, um, I would recommend to focus more on the enzymes involved in that process. Um, and as you also know, um, glucose is the main fuel in cellular respiration um, and uh, it's used as a source of energy. Um, you may have to know the different structures of different types of sugars. So gl glucose is um, just a simple sugar, but um, uh, when you, you can combine two sugars um, to form uh, like disaccharides. Um, so a monosaccharide is a, um, is a simple sugar like glucose or galactose, but um, combining them, you can get disaccharides or polysaccharides, um, and they all form uh, the different types of sugars as listed below. Um, and then uh, you will also um, want to look into their role in the uh, in the fermentation process. So, for example, um, glucose uh, eventually forms a three carbon sugar known as pyruvate, and um, that also uh, is used in the um, in the citric acid cycle. So, um, yeah, that's there may be uh, more specific um, details as to how that works, but um, that's just a general overview of what you should uh, what you should study. So. Um... Also another like important part of food science is um, learning how to read nutrition labels. Um, and this just is something that's been pretty uh, widespread across food science, whether it was like uh, three years ago when Ishka and I did it with dairy or grains and now it's just in fermentation and it's just a good skill to learn in life. So um, Ishka, could you talk about some of the um, I guess like steps you take in um, reading nutrition labels or things uh, you should look out for? Uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of fermented and acidified foods, there aren't um, going to be any sort of unique um, things specific to a nutrition label. Um, but uh, over here is an example. You can see um, the serving size and the servings per container. And um, each of these 
nutritional values um, are what is contained in one serving size. Uh, so you can see the total calories at the top and then um, the total fat and the different types of fat. Um, you see everything broken down um, into its individual components. And um, this is mostly going to stay the same um, since uh, fermented foods don't have anything like specific um, in relation to um, these different types of uh, constituents, but so it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then you could see the uh, the percent daily value of these different nutrients. Um, in terms of calorie count, um, one gram of fat contains nine calories, and then um, one gram each of carbohydrates and proteins contains four calories. Um, and then there might be something else that I'm missing, um, but you can look up. Uh, yeah, also like ingredients. So like they might ask you like, well, yeah, it's ingredients are super easy. So you just, they might ask you what, so oh, they also might ask, so for ingredients, they might ask you how is, how are the ingredients listed in the thing? Are they listed in alphabetical order? Or are they listed in quantity? So you are um, always in quantity from greatest to smallest. And then they also might ask you about like food administrations like the FDA or... So we have to that out on the next slide. Um, so uh, acidified foods are classified as foods in which acid is added and they form an equilibrium pH below 4.6. Um, there are also something called as, there are also some things called low acid canned foods and um, these are foods that um, have an equilibrium pH greater than 4.6. Um, however, uh, tomatoes and alcoholic drinks um, sometimes fall into this category. Al alcoholic drinks do not fall into this category and um, tomatoes um, may have a pH less than that, but um, still have this classification. Um, since, the, since fermented and acidified foods has such low pH values, um, they generally, sorry, that was a typo, there's a typo in there. It says general, it should say generally do not cause foodborne illnesses um, because uh, the harmful bacteria that cause these illnesses don't survive in that environment. So there are pretty few FDA regulations as to food safety, what um, food safety uh, is in terms of these foods. Um, there has been a recent update to the protocol of gluten-free fermented foods. Um, basically, so for example, beer is a fermented food that does contain gluten, at least most types of beer. Um, so it cannot be designated as gluten-free. However, when a food is fermented, um, it's hard to detect the gluten in that food. So basically what manufacturers now have to do is prove that their food is gluten-free before the fermentation process in order to get that gluten-free designation. So that is a re recent update um, uh, from the FDA. And so you should just really keep out for regulations like that. Um, like I mentioned with these, um, with this particular category, they're not as prevalent, but uh, it's definitely um, a common question that we got and they will likely give it to you. Uh, yeah, so next we have silly respiration. So um, aerobic respiration, so, well, yeah. So you have to know a lot about cellular respiration, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, which is, um, so respiration is how like oxygen breathing creatures, well, aerobic uh, respiration is how oxygen breathing creatures uh, sorry, convert fats into like energy and stuff. So you have to know whether uh, fermentation processes are aerobic or anaerobic. Um, so like an anaerobic, I'm sorry. Yeah, so whether it's aerobic or anaerobic determines like a lot about its taste and stuff or just how, yeah, just it determines a lot about the food. So you've got to know whether this food is fermented anaerobically or this food is aerobic. So um, Okay, so next is just general lab knowledge. And I know that, um, you know, this year there isn't a lab component to um, the test. However, I still think that 
um, these questions will come up during tests because this is um, what people would normally add um, uh, without like a pandemic when we do have the lab component to food science. And I think that these processes are very important to know. Um, so first is just the Benedict's test and it just tests um, reducing sugar. So you um, basically put uh, your uh, food into a test tube and then you add the solution and then um, you heat it. And then uh, based on like what um, color your solution turns, you can be able to determine like uh, how much uh, reducing sugars you have. And then you also have the Biorets test um, for proteins. Um, so basically it's like the same process. You take like um, um, a solution and then you uh, place on like a food science belt and a test tube and then you also heat it up and um, based on if it uh, stays blue or if it turns a more purplish color you'll know if um, that solution has um, uh, components of amino acids or uh, proteins in them and then lastly um, is the iodine test and this is probably the easiest test to understand um, it's just a vial of iodine and Basically, if you put um, a drop of iodine on a starch, like um, maybe like styrofoam or maybe like a type of bread or a potato or something like that, um, that uh, whatever like that potato will turn this very blackish dark color and that will indicate that it's a type of starch. Um, so these are just some general lab questions that um, like uh, food science proctors might ask you on the test. Mm -hmm. And then just like towards the end, here's our contact information. Um, we have emails right here. And if you want to DM us on Instagram, here are our Instagrams as well. Um, and just feel free to ask us if, you know, you have any questions like after this live stream. Um, and now we'll just open it up to Q&A if anyone has any just general questions about food science, any specific questions, uh, we'll do our best to try to answer them. Ishika and I, like like I said before, Ishika and I um, have done it for two years and we were sort of, uh, we sort of know the process. And then Ethan right here um, has, uh, he did it last year and is now in it again. Or if you have any questions about Science Olympiad in general, um, it's been a while since Stephanie and I have been in food science, but we've been doing Science Olympiad for like a long time now, I think five years. Um, I think six Yeah, years. seventh grade, so for me. So this will be our, I guess, seventh, sixth year of participation. And we have some questions. Uh, uh, are there any cooking related questions? Um, not really. Um, no, all you need to know is uh, basically what we said here. There's not, there's there's nothing about like, yeah, there, there's no, nothing about cooking <laughs> like that I've seen at least. I don't know. I think that like would they, go ahead. Sorry, would, would they ask about um, fermenting something? Maybe the, the process behind that? Uh, yeah, they might ask about that. Like they might ask how long it takes to ferment, but like that's really rare. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I saw that in a practice test once, but never really like. Really yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, they asked and cooking questions and yeah. the science behind it. No. Yeah, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe they might. Maybe you should um try to understand how some of the processes work. Like if you're um refrigerating something or if you're dehydrating something maybe try to understand the molecular process behind that um just uh, see what's happening to the molecules inside dehydration is probably in relation to a concept called osmosis um that you have to learn in biology but i think that otherwise like um just uh just know the processes of fermentation i don't think you need to know like like baking or anything like that. 